Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. This week, Connecticut has had trains running through it for just about 200 years now, and we've seen more than our fair share of major fatal accidents. Instead of devoting separate episodes to each one, we're just going to summarize all these incidents from around the state into one episode. No guests this week, I'm just going to tell you the stories myself. We will do a trivia question, however. The question is, why were newsroom telephones in Western Connecticut ringing off the hook on the evening of Tuesday, May 26th, 1987? So stick around for the answer to that question at the end of today's program, because that'll tell you what we're going to talk about next week. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. Yale New Haven Hospital was the very first hospital in Connecticut. They opened their doors 200 years ago and later introduced the entire country to the use of penicillin and chemotherapy. Today, some of the brightest minds in medicine choose to work there, and it's the primary teaching hospital for the prestigious Yale School of Medicine. For more information, log on to YNHHS.org. That's YNHHS.org. Train travel in Connecticut has been here since the early 1800s, nearly 200 years now. And in that time, Connecticut's seen some rather awful train crashes, resulting, unfortunately, in a whole bunch of deaths and injuries. Early railroad travel was extremely dangerous. There were an awful lot of derailments. Sometimes the track just malfunctioned and the train fell over. It was really a very dangerous proposition to take a train in the earliest days. They had no system controls, so there was no electronic lighting system like there is today. And the only communication they really had was telegraph between stations, and that wasn't even always available with every station at the start. Engineers had to rely on getting handwritten instructions at the start of their shift, so they had no onboard communication. Once they left the station, that was it, and they didn't know what was going on outside of the train. So if a change was made by a local train dispatcher at a station, the engineer on board would have no way of knowing that that change had been made. And there was also no communication on board between the staff, So, for example, today you take a train, you see they both have walkie-talkies, the engineer, the conductor, they can talk back and forth to each other. They didn't have that in those days. Well, I find in my travels that most Connecticut residents really have no idea about how many train accidents there were in Connecticut and, frankly, how many fatalities went along with them. Now, we've already done an episode about probably the most famous train crash in Connecticut. It was the one in East Thompson in the northeast corner of the state right near the Rhode Island, Massachusetts border. It was way back in 1891, but four trains collided in a period of just 10 minutes. Now, there has been another accident in the United States involving four trains, but it happened over a series of hours where two trains collided, then about an hour later another one hit them, and a couple hours after that a fourth train came in. This was just in 10 minutes in East Thompson. Now, amazingly, only two people were killed in that one, but dozens were injured, and some of them very badly. And if you're interested, the story was covered in episode 61 from October of 2022. So we're going to turn back the clock to 1853 to when Connecticut set another train accident record, this one involving a train bridge. It was in Norwalk, and it was the first time that a train had gone off a bridge in the United States. Well, it was the bridge that goes over the Norwalk River as it empties into Long Island Sound. The bridge was one of those that rotates or swings open to let the boats pass through, and then after the boats go through, it swings back shut. Well, these were the very early days of railroad travel. There were no electronic signs like there are today or automatic notifications to engineers. Instead, what they had was a pole on the side of the track with a red metal ball that was visible. They would pull it up the pole so that the engineer would see it to say the bridge is open, you have to stop the train. Well, the engineer on board that train that day was a substitute for the usual engineer, and the substitute was making only his third run on that particular route, and he didn't see the red ball. Now, by the time he realized what was going on, it was way too late. 
The SS Pacific Steamboat had passed through the opening. It was on its way into Long Island Sound. The bridge operator was getting ready to close the bridge, but the substitute engineer already had his engine made of steel flying along with 200 passengers on board behind him with five passenger cars, two baggage cars, all of them made out of wood. Well, the train rounded a curve before the bridge. It was supposed to be going just five miles an hour. Instead, he was going 30. The engineer saw the open bridge, threw on the brakes, put the engine into reverse, but as I said, too late. The fireman on board and the engineer jumped to safety as the engine ran off the track and into the water with almost the rest of the train following suit. 48 people were killed, 30 were injured, and among the dead, seven doctors returning to Boston from New York, where the annual American Medical Association meeting had just been held. Now, fast forward 12 years to 1865, and we still don't have all the communication systems ironed out on the train tracks. The Housatonic Railroad, for example, which ran trains from Bridgeport to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, operated both passenger and freight service. Now, this particular day in 1865 was a Monday, August 14th. To put it in some context, the Civil War had ended earlier that year, and just four months earlier, President Lincoln had been assassinated. Well, the plan for that day for the central crew that was based in Bridgeport was that there were going to be two trains departing out of Bridgeport and heading north into Massachusetts. First train, a freight train, and it took off. The second train following it was a passenger train, and it left more than an hour later. Now, both of the engineers had received their written instructions, and neither was required to pull into a siding or let any other trains go by because they were both simply heading north and there were no other trains coming toward them. Well, when the passenger train came around a corner going into the steep and narrow Trumbull Valley, this has a lot of rock cliffs on both sides, they spotted warning signs on the track. Well, that was good. The engineer stopped safely and got out of his train to see what was up, and he met the crew of the freight train, and sure enough, their engine had malfunctioned. Well, the passenger train engineer realized he wasn't going to go anywhere. He was stuck there and couldn't go any further north, so he offered to hitch his engine to the back of the freight train and back up all the way into Bridgeport, pulling the freight train with him. There were no other trains coming behind them, so that should work. Well, both engineers thought about it and agreed. They said, let's go ahead and start the operation. So back in Bridgeport, what they didn't know was that the train company had just received delivery of a new engine, and they had been waiting for this engine for a long, long time. Now, in Bridgeport, they realized that both those trains had been dispatched. They'd been gone a long time. They were both going north, so the track should be free and clear. So they decided, let's take the new engine out for a joyride and see what it could do. The engine was going very quickly when it rounded a curve, and unfortunately, the engineer saw the back end of the passenger train going backwards towards them. Well, needless to say, it was too late. They slammed into the back of the passenger train, split the last car down the middle. The scalding hot water from the engine's boiler was spewed all over the passengers. Eight passengers were killed, 20 were burned horribly. Since there were no communication systems and the crash occurred in a sort of no man's land that existed between some train stations, a crew member had to run all the way back to Bridgeport to alert them as to what was going on. So they put together a new train with doctors and medical supplies and it was put together rather hastily and driven to the site. And those who were injured and in serious shape simply had to wait for the help to arrive. In the town of Ridgefield, there actually used to be a short, four-mile-long spur line that connected the downtown of Ridgefield to the Danbury-Norwalk main line at the Branchville station on Route 7. Well, this Ridgefield spur line started operations back in 1885, and the passenger service ended in 1925, but freight service continued up until the end of 1964. Now it's all ripped up, and it's a rail trail for hikers. Now, the line may have been short, but that was not its most defining feature. Really, that was a very steep grade as it ran from Ridgefield down to Branchville. Well, it's 1905, April of 1905, and the conductor, William Horan, got into the cab in Ridgefield to run the steam locomotive down to Branchville, as he had done a number of times. There were two passenger cars and a baggage car behind him, and reportedly a large number of passengers on board, but nobody seems to know precisely how many. 
So he was about a mile and a half outside the Ridgefield station when the tender, which is the car that carries the coal and the wood right behind the engine that you used to shovel it into the boiler to make the engine run, well, the tender went off the track. It fell and slid down the embankment on one side of the tracks, and the engine fell in the opposite direction, and it slid about 100 feet. Horan was thrown from the engine, as was his onboard fireman. The fireman landed on a stone wall. He was pretty badly beat up, but he was alive. Horan, on the other hand, was pinned beneath the engine, enveloped in hot steam. They couldn't get to him right away because of the hot steam, and when they could, they had to dig out the ground from underneath him to remove his body. He was pronounced dead as soon as he was placed in the baggage car. Miraculously, not one of the passengers was seriously injured in that crash. Well, 1917, uh, about a decade later, August 13th was a Monday, and it was late in that first day of the calendar week, and it was particularly late if you hadn't had much sleep the night before. In fact, for William Tryon, he was working his 17th straight hour. Later, he'd tell investigators that he was just flat out exhausted. Unfortunately, Tryon was also at the controls as the engineer of a shoreline train heading from Old Saybrook towards New Haven along Connecticut's shoreline. Well, Tryon had a train full of passengers, many of whom were heading back to New York City after having spent the weekend at their summer homes in eastern Connecticut. The investigation would show that Tryon was supposed to have stopped his train at a rail siding and wait for an eastbound train heading the other direction from New Haven to pass him. Well, he did not. One witness told investigators that she saw Tryon dozing at the controls at the point where the train was supposed to be pulling over. Well, Tryon's train was rounding a curve and it smashed head on into the train from New Haven that was heading eastbound right at them. When all was said and done, 19 passengers would be dead, another 50 seriously injured. Virtually no passenger left that scene without some sort of injury. Tryon, though, was hospitalized and survived, and later he would be charged with manslaughter. In 1955, nothing short of a miracle that resulted in just one death, that of the engineer, in a frightening train accident in Bridgeport. It was a New York to Boston Express train that was heading on the main line along the Connecticut coastline. Now, when that train track gets to Bridgeport, there is still to this day an extremely sharp left-hand curve, about 90 degrees in fact, and the speed limit for any train going around that curve is supposed to be no more than 30. Well, it's the sharpest curve along the entire New York to Boston route, just to put it in perspective. The curve even has a name. It's called Jenkins Curve, and it's called that because the Jenkins Valve Company operated for many years right on that curve and was operating then in 1955. So it was July 14th of 1955, early in the morning before 4 a.m. It was train number 172, the Federal, left New York on its way to Boston. Now, it had passed its safety inspection in New York. All trains have to do that. Now, the train that's heading east was comprised of the engine and 17 different cars, including coach cars, sleeping cars, baggage cars, even a refrigeration car. And there were 175 passengers on board. The engineer was a 62-year-old railroad veteran. Now, one of his colleagues called him a scientific engineer. That's because he used to check all the measuring tools available before any run. He would look at all the onboard dashboard gauges, all the weather measurements for anything from wind to speed to humidity and temperature. Yes, Arthur Ortono didn't miss anything, and he was always prepared. Well, that morning in the pre-dawn hours as the train approached Jenkins' curve, his fireman, George Kennedy, was concerned because the train didn't seem to be slowing down like it was supposed to. In fact, it was going at full speed of 65 to 70 miles an hour, and he glanced over at Art and saw that he was looking at the speedometer, and George called out to him and said, Art, Art, and Art hit the brakes, but it was too late. Well, the engine and seven of the cars flew off the tracks and became airborne, landing in the maintenance yard of the Jenkins Valves Company. The cars were airborne for 300 yards, 900 feet. That's the length of three football fields. The fact that only Art Ortonow was killed is frankly unbelievable. There were some horrific injuries, though, among the 50 people who had to be treated, but everybody else survived. Well, 14 years later, in 1969, there would be a fatal crash on the New Canaan Spur line that runs from Stanford to New Canaan. 
It was a Wednesday during the summer, August 20th of 1969. The train was heading from Stanford to New Canaan. It had a three-man crew and 80 passengers, and it was running behind schedule. The engineer, 43-year-old Frank Bojarski. Now, coming the other way on the single track from New Canaan towards Stanford was a five-man work crew train driven by 37-year-old Edward May. Investigators would later say that both trains were traveling 30 miles an hour. The train heading towards New Canaan with the 80 passengers on board that was running late was supposed to have pulled off onto a siding in Darien. That did not happen. Just north of Hoyt Street in Darien, the trains instead collided head-on. Both engineers were pinned inside their compartments because the crash was so tremendous it caused both the lead cars to fold up like accordions. It took five hours to extricate Edward May. He was the engineer of the work train. Frank Bojarski, the other engineer, was killed. It turns out that there was a citizen in the compartment with Bojarski. He was killed as well. In all, four people died that day and 43 were injured. Well, if there is a silver lining to this crash, it was the one that finally prompted the pursuit of positive train control technology. That overrides poor engineer decisions and can automatically cause a train to stop short of a catastrophe. That wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path. The answer to this week's trivia question, why were newsroom telephones in western Connecticut ringing off the hook on the evening of Tuesday, May 26, 1987? Well, the answer, and I know because I was in one of those newsrooms, an odd-shaped UFO was seen in the skies over Greater Danbury by dozens of people. Now, this was the days before cell phones and the internet, so there weren't a lot of photos or videos, unfortunately. Next week on Amazing Tales, we'll have the state chapter president of MUFON. That's the Nationwide Mutual UFO Network. He's going to be here to tell us the history of UFOs in Connecticut. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and stay healthy. Thank you.